From the station that made country music famous, 650 AM WSM, this is a Coffee Country and Cody podcast. Hi, it's Charlie Matos, and in this episode, we sit down with Charles Esten. He was getting set to play the Friday Night Opry and two shows in the coming weeks at the beautiful Franklin Theater on the Historic Square in downtown Franklin, Tennessee. Of course, you know Charles from Deacon Claiborne and ABC and CMT's Nashville, and currently starring in the Netflix hit, The Outer Banks. Enjoy our Coffee, Country, and Cody podcast with Charles Esten. <laughs> hey, Billy, Billy, here, here. Charles Esten in studio this morning on Coffee Country and Cody. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to be here with you both. You just landed this thing. I literally, I mean, you apparently flew in <laughs> from New Orleans way later than uh, you thought you would get in, and then up this morning, and a flight from Brentwood International Airport to Gaylord Opera Lake. <laughs> it makes that a lot quicker when you fly in from Brentwood. Yeah. Uh, it's a three-minute flight, and uh, I mean, seriously, you barely get your coffee or your seat back up, and, and, you're, and you're landed. My wife and I were recently in New Orleans about a month and a half ago. Ago, though the new airport is really sweet i it? agree it yeah. was really nice and yeah. i should know because i spent an extra three hours in it <laughs> <laughs> so, i mean it is really sweet <laughs> next level <laughs> well you're playing the your favorite stage the grand Ole opry on a friday night this week how great is that when was the first time you played the Opry stage? Oh, was it in conjunction in, with the television show? Well, the first time would be when I was playing a guy named Deacon Claiborne, mm-hmm. and I was about 12 feet uh, to the left of uh, County Britain, um, back just a little bit, and I will never forget it. It was, it was kind of... That was a fortunate thing about me all along was that I got to do things in this town as deacon, yeah. as an alter ego. Uh, it would have been a little much just to step right up the first time, having never been on that stage, having never done anything. The same with the Bluebird or the Ryman. When I got to play the Opry at the Ryman, I had done all those things as deacon where I was able to soak it up a little bit and just sort of breathe a little bit and let my knees stop knocking. And you got to remember, and you remember, that when you shoot a scene in Nashville, it doesn't take as long as the scene. It takes all day. So yeah. I literally was blessed with the ability to stand on stage at the Grand Ole Opry for, I don't know how long we we're out there, 10 hours, 12 hours or something <laughs> oh, yeah. like that. So by the time I got out there, I was still very, very nervous my own self when I got to play there. But um, I, it was different. It was a different ball game because I'd had that under my belt. Recount for me getting the part of Deacon and when you knew that was going to happen, the audition, the process. Oh my goodness! This the, we don't have long enough. I'm just here to tell you that the best way I can say it is I frequently thought this. It would be as though your whole life you went around collecting little scraps of colored cardboard with interesting shapes, and you didn't know why. You just kept putting them in your pocket. Some good experiences, some bad. And then one day I pulled them all out. I put them on the table, and I realized they clicked together, and they all made this thing called Nashville. And when I tell you that's the truth, I mean it. Like for instance. Every little thing, I had been beaten out by the same guys for a long time. I'd been doing some great roles and been very fortunate being in shows like The Office or Big Love or all the way back to Cheers and Married with Children. But when it came to getting landing that big role, I just kept being beaten out by that same group of guys who were fantastic, all of them. Um, And then there came this show. I had been writing country music for a long time. And a friend of mine knew that, and he, he had been in Nashville a bunch, and he sent me a, a little text that said, you got to check out this new script called Nashville. So I went and I got it, and the first one uh, audition I did, I met Callie Curry was there at that audition. Right. And I played her a couple songs and, uh, sang, and sang and did some scenes. She later said that of all the guitar players there, I was the only one that brought a stand. Everybody else had their guitar leaning against the chair, just as I do right there. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all need a stand in this. Oh, there it is. It's occupied. <laughs> but I, she said that she couldn't, you know, being the wife of T-Bone Burnett, guitars have meaning to her. So she would watch while they were trying to audition. She's looking over at the guitar like, that's going to fall. That's going to fall. <laughs> and then here comes one guy that takes care of his guitar. I'm not saying they got me the job, but it was halfway there. And by the way, when I came out from that first audition, 
which coincidentally, uh, there's all these little coincidences that make it beautiful. I was in a show called Whose Line Is It Anyway? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The audition for Nashville was in the same building, same hallway as where my dressing room was for Whose Line Is It Anyway? No way. So I felt like I was home already, like when I was on the Opry stage before. Yeah. I had been there before. So I went and I did that, and I had my guitar stand, and it went real well. And as I came out the door, who was at the door but Hayden Panettiere, of course, (laughs) later playing Juliet Barnes. And she stepped back with this big smile on her face. And she clapped and she said the nicest things. And it was so uh, kind and uplifting. And I was, she was already famous and certain to get the role. And I was not so much, but still uh, in my joking uh, arrogance, I said, well, I'll see you on the set. And it was a long audition process after that, many more after that. But eventually we walked up and she said, see you on the set. Wow, it was awesome. That. I'm so glad you mentioned whose line is it, though, because that, that's I always think ad libbing is a lost art for many people. And that show is almost nothing but that. And I got to think the skills of doing that pay off in spades and so many, especially doing live stuff. huh? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Just the concept of improvisation of just being okay being in the moment and being aware and alive for whatever is coming at you we uh, i think fear causes us to sort of lay a path for how things are going to go and when we get knocked off that path it's like now what people say how do you do that but i always say you're doing it all the time like if when you're with a bunch of, first of all you guys know how to do it you do it all the time all day on this <laughs> microphone but for a normal <laughs> civilian <laughs> type they say how do you do that and i'm saying you know you're out to dinner with your friends and everybody's saying funny things and they're going back and forth and somebody says something asks you something you don't sit there and go oh what am i going to say what will i say now <laughs> you right. don't you just say it the difference is you're not nervous there so it's more than anything just conquering the fear and what you learn, though, when you go do these things is I've been on improv stages that, where you're just terrible and it doesn't go anywhere. And, of course, your friends have more fun the worse you are on the stage. They, they're, they're more hilarious when you're bad. You also have that in yeah. common with radio guys. Yes. <laughs> the thing you come to learn, though, is like stand-up. They say you died that night or you died on stage. Yeah. Well, if you do enough of them, you realize you don't really die. You know, the next morning your kids still need to waffle and, you know, your life goes on. So once you realize it's not life or death, it's just saying silly stuff, uh, you, you calm down a little bit and it gets fine. Hey, before we get to meet, and I want you to get to, you, since you don't have a stand and before it falls, I want you to get your, get your car and play for us in a moment. But Outer Banks, which is the present television work, movie work yes, in your sir. life on Netflix. And how... how how did that come about? Well, that was that was a real blessing. I got to tell you, when you're an actor and you get a role like Deacon Claiborne on Nashville, and there aren't many like that. I can't think of any. Um, I was kind of sure that that was probably going to be it for a little while. Sometimes you get so identified with the role that either they don't put you anything else, or what they send you is some sort of Deacon Light mm-hmm. character. That's mm-hmm. he's super Deacon. No, it's not like Deacon at all. But he plays guitar and he loves a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, what happened was the Pate brothers, Jonas and Josh, along with Shannon Burke, those are the three creators of the show. They just called me up and asked me to be on it. And at the time, they only had two scripts. And they said, this Ward character, it starts off, he's just the dad of the, sort of the princess there. Um, but believe us, it gets it gets wilder, it gets crazier. And they shared a little bit of it. So... Um, I was more than pleasantly surprised. And then you land in Charleston, we start shooting this thing, and I just fell in love instantly with this young cast of actors, and I knew the world would too. I didn't know it would get this big, but I knew that they had something special there. We've got Charles Heston in studio. For those of you watching on Circle Television, uh, you won't play live for us right here, right now? I would love to. Are you tuned and good to go? I am, sir. Okay. All right. This has a high note or two for a morning, but I, I, I'm nothing if not ambitious. <laughs> so uh, Friday night you'll be at the Opry, and you're playing the Franklin Theater. Back-to-back nights in mid-September, the 18th and 19th, which uh-huh. is that's I wanted, extraordinary. Just playing anywhere uh, is extraordinary these it days in our world, is. isn't Every it? time that we're out, I sort of notice how... <laughs> how different it all is just being out. I thought I didn't take it for granted, but I think we all probably did 
just a little bit, you know. So yeah. um, it's it's the best thing in the world, especially being on the Opry stage. It, it hits me every single time. This will be my my 141st time. Not that I'm you counting. <laughs> so uh, during uh, the downtime, I see that uh, Patty has become your day to day guy. My day to day. She please. She's your this my wife is your with manager, me here. your show booker. <laughs> she your everything. is my. She runs my empire. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> she's with you this morning. I had to point that out. Exactly. She's the only reason I made it through the door. <laughs> uh, uh, next time I want to actually I'm going to record it I'm going to bring it in I wrote a song not that long ago uh, co-wrote a song um, called One Good Move because that's what she is she's my one good move <laughs> when I was a kid I made a thousand bad ones I made one good one she's, <laughs> she's sitting behind me right now well set this up and play it for us this morning right, um, get your, your harpoon ready there I got a little bit of a harmonica here um it's called A Little Right Now. This is uh, for, for the lean times, I thought. My dad was a salesman, and he was always using that phrase "my ship come, when my ship comes in. So mm-hmm. this is for everybody that, that's in that boat. I'm a farmer praying for rain. I'm a gambler needs a nation of spades. I'm a dreamer. Been for my ship to come in. Man, that is sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you Charles so much. Charles Aston. Uh, did any of that uh, songwriter Hall of Famer stuff from John Scott Sherrill rub up on you when you passed in the hallway? He was I was just. A, you were I, I flew by him because, as you know, I got in here just on time. My flight from Brentwood was running late. <laughs> but I do believe I got a little of the magic when I bumped into him. <laughs> There's a lot of it there. Yeah, it's like 40 million singles sales of his songs in I, his Hall I've of Famer. often thought, and I and almost said this, I got to meet Paul McCartney a long time ago, and I almost yeah. said it, but I didn't want to come off as a smart aleck. I almost said, you know, they say songs are sort of out there in the ether. You don't write them. You just sort of grab them. Yeah. I, uh, leave some for the rest of us. Man. <laughs> <laughs> See you at the Opry Friday night. See you there, bud. Charlie will be there to bring you on. And that is Charles Eston. He's playing at Franklin Theater September 18th and 19th. Thanks for listening to our Coffee Country and Cody podcast. Our program director at WSM Radio is J. Patrick Tittle. Our digital producer is Haley Hall. Marketing and promotions director is Amanda Cannon. And I'm Charlie Matos. If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And leave us a review on iTunes. It really does help new people find the show.